Good afternoon and welcome to the STS-57 post-flight press conference. This afternoon the crew is with us to talk about the Eureka Retrieve and the first flight of the Space Hab Experiments module, plus some other experiments on board the flight. And to my right is the crew commander, Colonel, Air Force Colonel, Ronald J. Graby, and I'd like to introduce him and turn the program over to him. Ron? Thanks very much, Barbara. We're delighted uh, that you would all be here with us to so we can share the, the highlights of the flight. It was a, a great flight, and we're certainly interested in, in telling you all about it. Let me introduce the rest of the crew. To my right is Brian Duffy. Brian was making his uh, second flight on STS-57. He was our pilot. Uh, he was a member of the three-man or three-person orbiter crew, along with myself and, and the flight engineer. Uh, Brian also orchestrated the EVA for us. He uh, was the prime uh, choreographer of the rendezvous flight plan as well and he participated in a number of the space hab experiments. Uh, to Brian's right is David Lowe. David was the payload commander. That means that on this flight he had prime responsibility for integrating the space hab module. Uh, this being the first flight of space hab that uh, took quite a bit of his time. He was also one of our two EVA crew members. Uh, in addition to that, he was the prime operator for the RMS during the Eureka retrieve. So as you can see, he had a full plate on this mission as well. To uh, David's right is uh, Nancy Sherlock. Nancy was our MS-2, our flight engineer. She was the third member of the orbiter team for ascent and entry along with Brian and myself. Uh, Nancy was the prime RMS operator during the EVA, so that was a very busy day for her. And Nancy had a great deal of participation in the space hab experiments as well. On Nancy's right uh, is Jeff Weissoff. Jeff was also making his first flight along with Nancy. Uh, Jeff was the rendezvous mission specialist for this flight, along with Brian and myself. He was responsible for ensuring that the rendezvous profile was, was properly executed, and he had some particular responsibilities regarding uh, that as we closed in to Eureka in the final stages. Jeff was the second member of the EVA team, along with David. Uh, Jeff had a great deal of interaction with the Space Hab experiments, and he had a, well, a couple of other experiments that required his attention as well, including shoot and fare, which we'll talk about a little bit later. To Jeff's right is uh, Janice Voss. Uh, Janice always gets introduced last, but that's by no means least. She's uh, the person who had more than anyone else to do with the successful uh, implementation of the Space Hab experiment procedures on this flight. She really did the lion's share of the work back in Space Hab. In addition to that, we integrated her into the rendezvous profile, and Janice was the backup RMS operator during the EVA. So uh, as you can see, it was a full flight, and, and everyone on the crew had a great deal going on during the, the course of the 10-day mission. What we'd like to do with you today is uh, first show you a film that will cover the highlights, or some of the highlights of the STS-57 flight. And, and then after that, we'll sw switch the medium to uh, slides. And at the end of that, we'll have about a 20-minute question and answer period. So if we could roll the movie, please. This is our crew patch. I'm sure it's familiar to most of you. Here we are the night before launch. We actually had one dry run or dress rehearsal the day prior to launch. The weather wasn't quite good enough, but undaunted, we set out the next day. This is a beautiful sight. Here we are in the suit-up room on the morning of launch. Here I am adjusting my microphones. Here's Brian. Next, G. David. Everyone you can see is, is really anxious to go. Here's Nancy. We'll see a little hello here to, uh, to her daughter. Here's Jeff, in very high spirits, as is Janice, very eager to get on with it. Once our suits were all checked out and uh, confirmed that they were all operational, we headed out uh, to the pad. This is always a, a fun time. You go out, you know you're always going to be greeted by uh, a lot of folks at the end, at the end of the ramp there, people that uh, you're friends with. A few hours later, we get, when it's time to go to work, the, uh, of course the main engines start, and the, uh, the boosters light, and the STS-57 is on its way. The roll program for us this time was nice and smooth. We had a cloud that was nearby. You'll see us going, uh, going right by it. Went right by the edge of it. Uh, Ron and I had been sitting there looking uh, at it for quite a while. It was. It had just uh, moved left and right over the pad, but uh, was not a factor. 
Shortly after takeoff, you can see the shock wave here on the vehicle. Janice and I uh, rode on the mid deck, and the two events you really feel, other than other than the initial takeoff, is when the SRVs separate after about two minutes. Uh, we can feel and hear the sound of, of, of that separation. And then we go for another six and a half minutes on the main engines. And uh, one of my real great pleasures was my first sight of the Earth when I got to go up to the flight deck to participate in the external tank DTO photography. I handed uh, David a camcorder, and he took these great pictures of the tank floating away, and I was using an F-4 to take stills. Shortly after we arrive on orbit, we begin configuring the orbit uh, orbiter for orbit operations. This is me opening up the payload bay doors, and uh, Brian is taking film footage of the door opening, which we then later downlinked. And uh, for me personally, as those doors open and I got my first glimpse of the Earth from 250 miles, it was just absolutely spectacular. This is a view of the Eureka satellite as we're closing in on flight day four. It's actually sped up a little bit, but it gives you an idea of what Eureka looked to us. Uh, actually, it's coming down almost immediately overhead, Janice's vantage point as she was back in the space hab. Here we are on the flight deck, and you can see there's a, a lot of activity going on in this time frame. This is all just prior to grapple with Eureka. As Ron mentioned, while the other five members of the crew were up on the flight deck, I was using the space hab overhead window to look through a night vision system and the laser range you see me taking out there to help support the rendezvous with range and range rate data. This is the view that I had of Eureka as Ron was doing the fly around to get the grapple fixture poised for David's activity. You can see David here looking at the monitors to make sure everything's ready for him to grab a hold of the Eureka and put it back in the bay as Ron is uh, doing the fly around. And uh, this is the view again out of the, the D camera. You can see the RMS coming in uh, in the, the right hand portion of your picture there. Um, the, the payload was very, very stable. That's a, a tribute to both Ron's flying capabilities and, and also just how stable the payload was. It was rock solid there, um, which is, for an, from an RMS point of view, that's a great sight to see. Um, coming in here, this is just prior to grapple. In fact, I think uh, grapple's about right there, and now it's being uh, the, the end effector. The snares are actually pulling the, the payload into the end effector there. Um, this is a, a an A camera view right now. Um, and this, I don't know how many minutes later it was, we were already over in the uh, post-capture position. Um, and so the, uh, the, the payload is pretty stable there. What you can see uh, in the background there, we're just coming across the west coast of the United States. Um, you can see the LA basin down there with the, uh, with the clouds right there. And coming up uh, into view right now, about in the middle of the picture, is the, uh, the high desert area of, of California. And Edwards Air Force Base is just up beyond that. You can see the San Joaquin Valley up above that, too. One of the small problems that we had during the retrieval was that the antennas on Eureka failed to latch, so we took the opportunity post-grapple to send down some film footage of that so that the payload operations center over in Germany could take a look at that. And then uh, once everyone was satisfied, we had some good views, we began berthing operations and deactivation of Eureka. And this is David operating the robotic arm, manipulating a Eureka down into the berth position and uh, to latch it into the payload bay. And we then began preparations for the next day's EVA, which was to begin with an EVA to latch those antennas. The uh, berthing sequence itself went very, very smoothly. The next morning, uh, as Nancy mentioned, uh, we had the planned EVA. That was flight day five. And uh, we started out uh, making sure that the, the suits were all ready. Uh, once we got the, the crews into the suits, uh, we actually brought them into the uh, into the mid-deck area from out of the airlock where they can practice some translation techniques uh, and also uh, determine the way in which they wanted to carry their tools uh, out for the work that they knew they had ahead of them. Here we see uh, David and uh, Jeff and you can see just what tight quarters it is in the airlock. When the four-hour pre-breathe was up, uh, David opened the hatch on the tunnel adapter and the thermal cover, and here you can see him making his initial egress from the tunnel adapter. And then there's a shot from the inside of the airlock where you can see us positioning ourselves to go out. This is uh, myself positioning to go out. Dave's now outside of the hatch. And here I am following him out. He's in the lower left-hand corner of the picture now.
first task that we had to do was to basically set up the work site so that we could go uh, work on the Eureka antennas. And uh, Jeff installed a, a PFR attached device on the arm and a safety tether, and then I came on over and attached the portable foot restraint right there that, uh, that I was going to step in, and then uh, Nancy was going to drive me around on the end of the arm there. All of that is now attached to the end of the arm, to the end effector there, and I'm just about ready to ingress the portable foot restraint. You can see the arm, uh, you're going to see that move a little bit. It's uh, putting, putting some, uh, some inputs into the arm. You can see it, it, it probably moved up to a foot or so, and I think Nancy got some, some brake slip messages when both Jeff and I ingressed the, the portable foot restraint. And then from there, Nancy uh, drove me on over and positioned me in front of the uh, Eureka. The latching into the antennas uh, while Eureka was birthed in the payload bay was one contingency that we really hadn't trained to. So overnight, the RMS and EVA folks worked uh, very hard to send us some good procedures that they uplinked in the morning. And that involved manipulating David over in the middle of the payload bay and putting him right down between the chute payload and the Eureka payload to push on the antenna. We first went to the first antenna, which is a forward one. Here I am uh, manipulating him back to the aft antenna, and he's going to push on that antenna while the payload operations center commanded the latch. Jeff was absolutely invaluable to us. You see him over on the side. He was our eyes out in the payload bay to determine any clearances. The uh, Eureka portion of the, of the EVA took just a little bit less than two hours, and from that point on, we pretty much uh, went into the um, what we had planned as far as our uh, DTO was, and um, that involved three major objectives, the first of which was what we called mass handling. And in this case, I was on the end of the arm, and I was carrying Jeff, and we were simulating a, Jeff was just being basically a 500-pound blivet. Um, and I was using Jeff to simulate uh, maneuvering around a, a, a large scientific instrument that we might have to do on, on future missions. Yeah, he, he, was, he acted as blivet very well. <laughs> um, while we were doing this, Nancy would um, maneuver me forward and aft in the payload bay as well as um, up and down out of the payload bay. And uh, we did this both in vernier and coarse rates on the RMS. And uh, uh, results that, that I'd like to report are that uh, the, the arm is a, a, a very stable platform driving around in, in either vernier or coarse rates. Um, it was a, a fairly simple thing to do as long as you move slowly, as long as I, the, the inputs I made into the, the mass were, were slow inputs. Um, it was very, very controllable. You can see here me uh, rolling Jeff around just a little bit. From there, we went on and we did some fine alignment. And again, we found the, the same results there. As long as you move slowly on fine alignment, you can uh, uh, align things very precisely. After the uh, fine alignment task, uh, David and I switched places on the arm. And uh, I was going to do the third task, which was the high torque task. The idea behind this was uh, being held in the foot restraint on the arm to go down and use a torque recorder to, to torque on some bolts, which is what I'm doing here, that were held, uh, a bolt, bolt that was held on the sill. And the idea there was to look at the reaction forces and how the arm moved as we, as we put those inputs into the bolt. And that turned out to work very easily, very much like our wet F training, and uh, seemed to be a very easy operation to do while you're held in the foot restraint. The other major payload we had on board was Space Hab. This was the first flight of Space Hab. It's a commercial module connected to the crew compartment by a tunnel. There's a hatch at either end of the tunnel for ascent and entry, and you see David here opening up the hatch on flight day one so we can get Space Hab ready for experiment operations. It flew uphill powered because some of the experiments required temperature control and monitoring, but there were a number of systems that had to be started up on that first day to get ready for use. You see David here on the forward wall of Space Hab where the Space Hab subsystems equipment mostly was getting things ready to start operations. This is the tunnel, going down the tunnel that was connecting the two parts of the Space Hab and the orbiter. This is early on in the flight. It gives you a nice view of the aft wall of Space Hab before we've put out all our experiment procedures and gotten a little more clutter than it, as you'll see in later views. This is Brian checking out some orbiter equipment that we had stowed back there that actually is the laser ranger that we used on the Eureka Retrieve Day. And you can see how the aft wall is covered with lockers very similar to the mid-deck lockers. Space Hab was envisioned as kind of an extension of the mid-deck to give you access for lots of uh, experiments doing early design work. This is the port wall 
It sh we found that to be a very convenient place to store our procedures and the computer disks. You can see me taking some computer disks out there, as well as Nancy working on an experiment on the forward wall. With two people back there in the corner, you can see there's plenty of space in zero-g to get around, and Space Hab was a very nice area to work. It was nice and bright and had a lot of easy access for getting into the experiments. The starboard wall, Space Hab has the capability of putting racks in. You see Jeff here working at the rack, which had a workbench on it and some foot restraints. It was very handy for performing experiments, and you saw me working on a computer. We also had some experiments in the mid-deck. This is Ron working on one of our protein crystal growth experiments, adjusting the focus for some photo TV we were taking of it. We flew a lot of computers on this flight, and uh, this is an experiment uh, tools and diagnostic system, which is basically checking to make sure you can do some IFM on, on baseline equipment. This is a liquid encapsulated melt zone, and by encapsulating it in a liquid, they were hoping to grow very pure crystals. And this is Jeff also uh, operating a, an experiment called CGBA, which involved mixing the fluids together, and then you'll see him shake the fluids here in a second. And these were mostly all biological samples that he was activating. One of the experiments I ran from the MIDIC was called SCG for solution crystal growth, and we're stirring some solutions here to, as a precursor to an, another experiment that grew some ceramic crystals. Uh, here's just a quick shot of uh, one of the things I did uh, one day was to solder a circuit board, uh, the idea being to uh, look into how feasible it is to do on-orbit repair of electronic uh, components. Uh, another thing we were doing back in the Space Hab uh, was we were actually looking at an experiment that was looking at how feasible it is to grow plants in space, which is something that we figure we'll have to do in the long term, and that's what Nancy was doing here. Looks like she got going in one direction and figured out it was easier to just spin all the way around. Another experiment that we carried called uh, SHOOT, which was superfluid helium on orbit transfer, was operated from a PGSC on the flight deck. Uh, Janice and I worked with that PGSC, and Brian and uh, Ron coordinated the burns. Here you can see the cryogenic doers for the uh, superfluid helium on the MPES structure. The idea behind this experiment is to study the transfer of cryogenic fluid for future servicing of satellites. The other uh, secondary that we carried on the mid-deck called FAIR is uh, a fluid transfer experiment between two tanks to study uh, future design of propellant tanks. This particular one is very similar to the design that's planned to be flown on the Cassini probe that will go to Saturn uh, at the end of the decade. We had a lot of training pre-flight and Earth observations because, of course, looking out the window gives you a very interesting view of the Earth. You can see me taking some pictures there with our 70 millimeter camera, which gives you very high detail for looking at the Earth. This is a view of the Sinai Peninsula. You can see the uh, Gulf of Aqaba there leading down into the Red Sea. This is further down under the Horn of Africa, the Somalia area at the southeast corner of the Red Sea. And this is not Africa. <laughs> this is the, uh, the west coast of Australia there. You can see uh, Exmouth Bay, which is the, the, the big bay that you see along to the right there. And uh, Sharks Bay is just underneath the, the tail of the orbiter there. And uh, one of the other experiments that we did was called DSO-618, um, riding a cycle ergometer. Um, it was one of the other experiments that we were trying to uh, use to increase your orthostatic tolerance when you come back and, re and land on Earth. We were extremely busy on this flight, and as you can see, Jeff didn't take time to eat, so Janice felt compelled to feed him. And just like every crew, we felt obligated to play with our food. However, in this case, we decided to take this opportunity to bombard Jeff behind the camera there with M&Ms. One of the other things that we flew was a uh, bear for the drug abuse resistance program, a dare bear. And uh, his little t-shirt says, dare to keep kids off drugs. And he got pretty good at translating across the mid-deck. As you're getting ready to come home for entry, you check out some of the systems on board that you haven't been using in a while or in the entry configuration, making sure everything's ready. This is a checking the RCS system. You can see Brian and, and Ron moving around. Of course, actually, it's the orbiter moving around as the jets fire. And you can see how they are enough of an input that there's a significant movement on the part of the orbiter. With the wave off days we had, we got a little more chance to look out the windows. You see the Terminator here. As everybody had told us, first time flyers, sunrises and sunsets are gorgeous. As you heard, we had a lot of practice at deorbit prep, and this is one of the scenes on the flight deck as we prepare to come in uh, in the LESs. 
Uh, David did a lot of his camcorder footage and Brian did from the flight deck so you can kind of see the, the aft part of the flight deck there and everybody's seated and ready to come in. Once we were uh, decided to get serious about this entry stuff, well, we finally did the do over at Burn and uh, we were in the dark for some of the high mock time and uh, up in Mach 24 range and here you see the plasma which uh, surrounds the vehicle uh, during the entry up there. We flew into the daylight around Mach 23 so we didn't get to see that all the way down. Uh, we Also we got to Florida short of 9 in the morning so we probably didn't wake everybody up but we think we, uh, we announced our arrival with the sonic booms. Here we are with a view of the orbiter on the final approach. We landed at KSC uh, runway 33. It was a great treat for us to be able to come back to KSC. You always like to bring the orbiter back to the place that you launched from. Here's a view taken from the STA, the shuttle training aircraft, as we uh, approach the runway. The wheels are now down, just crossing the underrun, crossing the threshold to the runway. And now we transition to uh, a view looking down the runway. There's touchdown. If you look for them, a, a brief flash here at the tail. There it is. That's the drag chute beginning its deployment sequence. You can see the drag chute coming out on the side view. There's the shuttle training aircraft uh, flying with us in the vertical assembly building going by in the background. There's nose gear touchdown. And now a picture looking head on at the orbiter from the other end of the runway. There's drag chute jettison. You can see it comes almost straight down. Uh, we didn't have much of a crosswind that day at all. It was almost an ideal condition for a landing.